everyone. I just want to say welcome to everyone for joining us uh, to um, Spine Time. Uh, my name is Paul Park. I'm one of the spine surgeons here at Cornell and uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery. And uh, really looking forward to today's session. Um, I think it's a really kind of practical and, and useful topic that um, I think will be applicable for a lot of people here. Um, so the title of today's presentation is Images of Your Spine, from X-rays to MRIs to CT scans, uh, what imaging your doctors may order and how those pictures are interpreted. Next slide, please. Uh, just briefly, um, we're all very fortunate to work at the uh, Center for Comprehensive Spine Care uh, at Cornell. Uh, it's really a collaborative effort between multiple departments uh, from pain management, uh, rehabilitation medicine, uh, neurology, uh, radiology, as well as uh, surgery, and um, also all being under the same roof at the corner of uh, 59th and 2nd is has definitely facilitated a lot of collaboration and uh, has been a great, uh, a great system for us to take care of uh, uh, basic spine health in all aspects. Next slide, please. Uh, excited to uh, introduce our two experts today who will really be taking us through uh, a lot of the details and um, information that'll help uh, at your next visit. Uh, the first is Dr. Gail Salama. She's an assistant professor of clinical radiology, uh, as well as a director of spine imaging uh, here at Cornell. And then Dr. Jathleen Joshi, who is an assistant professor of anesthesiology and specializes in uh, interventional pain management. Next slide, please. And so we're just going to go ahead and get started, Gail, if uh, you don't mind, with uh, really the causes of low back pain and how this will relate to imaging of your spine. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, really glad to be able to talk to you and hopefully answer some questions that may be able to help you before you come to the spine center or if you're already a patient, uh, how we can continue to help you. So this topic today is about imaging of your spine. But before we get any imaging to evaluate our patient's pain, our first step is really getting to know, know them. And uh, when patients present to us with issues such as back pain, we work hard to do the detective work that's needed to determine what are the causes of uh, a patient's pain, how does it affect their daily function, their mood, and so on. So because that really helps us guide our care and find a care and treatment plan that really focuses on your life and how you can get back to uh, function. The causes of low back pain are multitude. It ranges from inflammatory disorders, organ dysfunction like kidney disease or pancreatitis, uh, malignancy, weak bones, osteoporosis, strain in the muscle, compression of nerves uh, in the spine, or uh, injury to nerves outside of the spine, which are called peripheral nerves. Um, you can also get degenerative disc disease, herniated discs, spinal stenosis, sacroiliac joint dysfunction, joint injury, infection. So the causes are vast and a lot of these issues cause the same type of pain. So having a conversation with our patients, doing the appropriate physical evaluation, helps us determine how to move forward. Um, next slide. The three to four main reasons why most people present to us with back pain is they have bulging discs, which are kind of like the cushioning in between our vertebrae, or they can have arthritis in the joints, so the two that connect vertebrae together. And third is spinal stenosis, which is a narrowing in the spine canal, um, which is the space that houses nerves. In order to link what we think is going on in someone's uh, back, we, need, we also get imaging to help us look into the spine and guide our plan for treatment. And one of the first things that we do is get an x-ray, which is a quick way to look at the spine and its bony structure. I'll let Dr. Um, Slama talk about x-rays to begin with. Sure. Um, next slide, please. So, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Dr. Park, thank you for the introduction and inviting both myself and Dr. Joshi here to talk about um, back pain, which affects um, millions of Americans and people across the world. And specifically, my area of expertise, which is how we image 
um, this area of the body and what steps we make to help our colleagues in all of our different specialties that evaluate patients with back pain. Um, you know, how we pick their imaging, how we interpret their imaging, and then how we work in an in interdisciplinary fashion to get the best treatment um, for our patients. So as Dr. Joshi explained, um, a lot of the times radiographs are our first step in evaluating patients that present with back pain um, for, for various reasons. Um, the first is they're the easiest. It's the least taxing on patients usually. It's the least expensive option. Um, and it sort of gives a good overview of what might be going on in someone's spine. Um, and there's different ways that we can take the x-rays. Um, generally, patients are standing up for these type of x-rays, although we can have patients lying down as well or sitting if necessary. Um, and we can take them in different angles to see what's going on inside of the patient's body and their spine. So these are just a few examples of pretty basic spine images. The picture on the left is taking a picture from the front of the patient. And then the two pictures in the, the middle and the right side are when the patient is turned to the side and we're looking through the side of their body. And these images actually tell us a lot of information. Um, first and foremost, what do the patient's bones look like? Do they look like they're normal in density? Um, do they look aligned? Are they in the right position? Are there any obvious fractures? Um, so major bony abnormalities can be seen really easily by x-ray. Some of the other things that we look for on radiographs include the alignment. So the line that the spinal column is making on these radiographs is a really important piece of information that we can share with our colleagues and that we can share with patients um, to have a better idea of um, what their spinal column is doing. Um, we look for if there's movement of the vertebrae, the bones of the spine in, in different positions, and that can be really useful information. So radiographs can give us information about dynamic things. So how patients look in one position versus another position. So that's really important information that we can get from radiographs. Some other additional information is how the patient's spine is degenerating and if it is degenerating at all. And can we see that on radiographs? So we're looking at different parts. We're looking at the disc spaces. We're looking at the joints, the connection between each of the vertebrae within the spine and how those connections look and if there's any evidence that those are degenerating or patients are getting what's called arthritis of those joints. Um, and in addition, we can also um, see things that are surrounding the spine. Um, we can see what's going on in the sacrum a little bit or the sacroiliac joints. We get a little bit of the pelvis as well. Um, and although x-ray isn't perfect for soft tissue, it does give us a little information about what's going on in the surrounding soft tissues. So there's a lot of things that we can decipher or figure out from a radiograph, which is a really easy diagnostic test for a patient to receive. Um, and then we can work with our referring physicians who saw the patient, evaluated them, and decide if, if that was enough information or shall we move on and um, potentially get um, a higher level piece of information through imaging. Uh, Dr. Salam, a quick question on x-rays. Some patients get their x-rays laying down and their physician may ask that they repeat their x-ray standing up. Can you go into a little bit about why that may be helpful or why a surgeon or a, or a interventionalist may want to have that standing x-ray as well? Sure. Um, I, I think that's a really good piece of, um, a good question and something to think about. So the body can change and the alignment of the bones can change um, and depending on if someone's lying down or standing up. So an easy example to think of is scoliosis, which is curvature of the spine. Um, if a patient lies down and their hips are shifted to one side versus the other, and that's sort of a voluntary shift and they, they have a choice about where they could put their hips, you may create the appearance that a patient has a really significant curve to their spine when they're lying down just by the way that they're placed or the way they lie down on the table. Whereas, and, and they may not actually have that curvature, um, which is a really important thing to identify. So by standing the patient up, you eliminate some of that optional movement of where the hips go when they're lying down or where the shoulders go when they're lying down. And you can get a better um, sample of 
really if there is that curvature or if that goes away when somebody's standing up. So that's a really good example of how things can shift between lying down and standing up. And with the x-ray, you can do that. You have the option of different positions um, and in lying down, standing up, bending over, arching back. There's lots of different maneuvers you can do. Whereas with a CAT scan or an MRI, a lot of those position choices don't, don't exist. All right, we can uh, move on to our, our next slide here. And I just want to encourage everyone, if you do have any additional questions, just uh, put it in the chat box and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible. Sure. So a lot of the um, procedures that we do at the Spine Center rely on us having knowledge or an understanding of what specific nerves are affected in uh, someone's body. So one of the common procedures that we do is an epidural steroid injection. And there's various types of epidural steroid injections um, based on the type of problem that you may have. Um, but all of them rely on us being able to get live imaging uh, of your spine at the time of the procedure. And that helps us guide placement of um, small needles that will actually deliver medication to a specific nerve or a specific part of the spine. So the the imaging I'm showing you here is of an epidural steroid injection. So we're, um, we're actually targeting steroid delivery to a specific nerve that may be inflamed. If you go to the next slide, this shows a common procedure that we do for uh, low back pain, which is called radiofrequency ablation. And that's a treatment that we use to uh, destroy nerve communication from a joint to your brain so that you feel less achy, nagging back pain. Um, but the important role of these procedures, uh, it, they, we couldn't do them if we had if we didn't have better understanding of the internal anatomy. So Dr. Salama talked about x-rays, which are very good at looking at the bone structure, but sometimes we need to get a deeper look and look into the spine and see which nerves are affected, what does the soft tissue look like? And that's where CT scanning and MRI come into play. And I'll let Dr. Salama talk about that. Uh, sure, Dr. Thanks. Joshi, before we um, move sure. on, a uh, quick question. What Some patients will get an epidural steroid injection, and then their doctor may send them for another injection, like a transferaminal injection. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about why yeah. they may do one versus the other? Yeah, sure. If you go to the prior slide, um, so there's two main types of epidural steroid injections. The, the first is what's called an intralaminar epidural steroid injection. That's kind of like a more generalized injection to try to get multiple areas within the spine that may be affected. So uh, we're going in between uh, two structures, which are called the lamina, which is form the back arch of the spine canal, and we're delivering medication to them. However, Sometimes patients may need more selective injections, uh, and that really helps guide which nerve is being affected, and it helps us understand, you know, yes, you may have disease process in two or three different levels of your spine, but do we want to operate on all three of those? Because that may be excessive. There may be one that's actually causing the pain. So we do a different type of injection, which is a selective nerve root block or what's called a transferaminal injection, which is the picture at the top right, um, where we're actually guiding a needle to a very specific nerve for two reasons. One, obviously to treat pain, but also it's diagnostic because it helps us evaluate whether someone is suffering from pain from that specific nerve or not. Um, so that's the two types of epidural steroid injections. And that's where uh, MRIs come into play. We work really hard with radiology. We actually send them notes, talk to them and say, you know, I'm worried about this specific nerve or this specific area of the spine. When you look at your MRI, can you please like try to focus on these areas and give me more detailed information about them? Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point that the more communication there is between the person who's evaluating the patient in clinic 
and talking to the patient, getting their history, doing a physical exam, and then telling the interpreted the interpreting radiologist exactly what symptoms that patient's having, uh, the more precise we can actually be with our interpretation of what's going on and what what findings may be clinically relevant, meaning significant for the patient and pain generating versus what are we just seeing on imaging that may not actually be causing physical symptoms in the pain and all it is is an imaging finding diagnosis. Um, and that important distinction between noticing what's on the image and then actually meaning something for the patient is, it, you know, it's important and it can be difficult. And that's where sometimes these injections really help in addition to the image interpretation, sort of delineating level by level what's going on in, in an organized fashion in order to get the best diagnosis for the patient. And so going off that, uh, just a couple of questions from the chat room. Um, can multiple injections be done at one time? And um, are there risks of any sort of CSF leak or uh, CSF headache after an injection? Sure. Um, to answer that second question, you know, every procedure we do has a risk attached to it. Our goal is to see what is the relative risk for any specific patient. So uh, any kind of injection you get can cause a risk of an infection, bleeding, um, and CSF leak. So the spinal fluid that bathes the nerves is surrounded by a sac. And so when we're actually doing an epidural steroid injection, we're not actually going in the nerve or in the spinal cord. We're going into an area called the epidural space that kind of is like an envelope around that, that nerve structure. So it can actually we can deliver medication to that area and though that medication can communicate with the nerve to treat pain symptoms. Sometimes, very rarely, you can have the sac rupture with the tip of a needle, um, and that will cause what's called a postural puncture headache. So, um, but the what is the relative risk of that? So it's less, much less than one percent for any given procedure that we do in the epidural space. And uh, you know, every time we do a procedure, we're using live X-ray imaging and comparing it to. MRI or CT scan to help guide the direction of a needle, judge depth, and prevent those kinds of uh, complications from occurring. And we use other adjuvants like contrast dye to help us see the flow of medication. And what's most important is that you know, every time we feel something is unsafe, we don't proceed. Excellent. All right, well, let me uh, keep going and we can start discussing MRI, which is really the next step in imaging that we often get. Um, so this is actually, I thought it would be nice to show an example of an MRI machine because some patients will have never seen one um, before they even enter the MRI suite or the room that the MRI scanner is in. So this is an example of MRI, we call it um, and you can actually, I purposely included this one because patients are often concerned that it's going to be this long closed tube that they won't be able to see out of. And if you look carefully in the center of the image, you can actually see it sort of long the machine is and that you can see through it. It's open on either end. Um, and, and the newer machines have wider centers also to make it less claustrophobic for a patient. Um, so often there'll be an MRI technologist with you when you come for your imaging that will welcome you, explain what is being done, what part of your body is being imaged, are you having contrast, which is an injection of dye in, in one of your veins through an IV, are you not having contrast, um, and confirming all your information, make sure that you're getting the right study, um, and that's what was ordered by for the you. Um, next slide. These are just a few examples of what MRI images look like, what we see as the radiologist and the referring physician. Um, MRI is a lot about what's in the soft tissues. So that's the difference between MRI and X-ray. X-ray really shows us bones and MRI shows us soft tissues. We also see the bones as well, um, but certainly the MRI gives us more information about the soft tissue. So specifically, we love MRI for any sort of disc pathology. Disc pathology is real. So abnormalities of the disc are really well seen on MR. So the example on the left in 
in this um, example is showing a normal spinal canal. So those little dots in the middle of the image, those are nerve roots in our spine. And the white surrounding those black dots are the fluid that normally surrounds your nerve roots. And that's a pretty open canal where those nerve roots are sitting nice in the canal. They're not being pressed upon. The image just to the right of that, that big blue arrow, shows a very different picture from the center of the picture from the one on the left. And that's really showing this soft tissue or disc material, basically changing the entire shape of it normally canal, you can barely see those dots or your nerve roots anymore in this picture. So this is a really good example of a large disc herniation that's really pushing on those nerve roots and probably causing this patient some significant pain um, syndrome. So this is really helpful in diagnosing a disc herniation. And, and you're not going to see this information on an x-ray. An x-ray can't see that soft material that is disc when it herniates into the canal. So you could have a pretty normal looking x-ray and normal bones and still have something pretty significant going on in your spine. Uh, this is an important reason to really have that conversation with your referring physician and ask the question, you know, I had my x-ray, bones look good, don't see much arthritis, but man, my leg pain or my, you know, lower extremity pain or low back pain is really nagging and it's not going away, you know, should we get an MRI? Should we look at the discs and how they're doing? So that's the two examples on the left. One is kind of normal and one has the big disc herniation. The pictures on the right are a little more hard, are, are a little more difficult to interpret for someone who hasn't really seen a lot of MRI. However, um, if you look in the center of the image, so we're looking at the third image now, there's a blue dot and then there's blue tracing around that dot. And what that's showing is the dot is a nerve root coming out of the, the um, side of the spinal canal where your nerve roots come out. And the tracing around it is the normal the individual has around that nerve root. So that's really normal. That means the nerve isn't being pressed. neural foraminal stenosis, which is a fancy way of describing the hole or the space that the nerve root normally comes out of when it exits the spinal canal. Um, and this neural foramen or this space is really narrowed for a lot of reasons, from arthritis, from disc, from abnormal alignment. And the nerve root here is getting squished or compressed by this narrowing and probably the cause of this patient's lower extremity symptoms. So things like this are much more difficult to diagnose on radiograph and much easier to diagnose by MR. Um, Dr. Salama, so uh, there are a couple of questions about getting MRIs and what position uh, patients get the MRI in. And I know the vast majority of MRIs are done laying down in the machine, but any um, experience with MRIs where people are upright or standing or in different positions as they're going through? Um, so it's a great question. Um, and there is, it's a little bit of a complicated answer um, and I'll address it in two separate ways. So um, in terms of upright MRIs where patients are standing or sitting versus lying down, this affects the quality of the imaging um, or the due to the strength of the magnet. So there's different strengths of MRI machines. And when patients have upright or standing MR examinations, often the magnetic strength that we use to get the signal from the, the information from the soft tissues is lower. So the quality of the image and the ability to see small abnormalities decreases when you use some of these open scanners that allow patients to be in different positions. Um, so while you may have slightly different results with patients in different positions, you it's a compromise on the quality of imaging. And we've found particularly um, imaging our patients is that we prefer the higher strength magnet, the, what we call the closed MRI machine, because we can find many more abnormalities that are that can diagnose patients that might have been missed on the 
lower quality scans that can be done in different positions. Um, and there aren't that many differences when patients are lying down, standing or sitting. Um, even though pain can be different in different positions, that doesn't always correspond with what we see on the imaging. And oftentimes the lying down version tells us the entire story. Um, and again, our, our higher quality imaging is, is more important to us so that we can actually find the abnormality um, with the lying down closed MRI scanner. Now you actually can do different positions in the closed scanner. So if necessary, we can actually change patient's position. We can have them in flexion or bending over or more extension, um, both in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine higher up. So even though the scanners that we use here are all quote, lying down scanners and closed scanners, we do have some ability to change patient's position if we need to, in order to get more information. Yeah, that's a very good. Point. Also from a surgical standpoint, quality difference from an upright or open MRI versus a closed MRI is, is very, very, uh, can be very striking. Um, and then just to fill in the gaps, I do think that um, taking the x-rays upright is really how we fill in the holes and kind of see where people may change in position and which side may be worse or better. Um, and that kind of all together gives us a very complete picture in addition to their supine MRI or laying down MRI uh, of the higher quality, I think. Um, and then, uh, uh, Dr. Joshi, some people uh, are told that they have arthritis in their back and the joints in their back are arthritic or uh, they're wearing out. And is it, can you give us uh, some tips or what to look for on the MRI that may kind of lead someone to say, we talked about disc herniation as part of what's causing compression of the nerve. How about joint? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think both of you brought up good points about uh, looking at these subtle changes and having a high resolution MRI and comparing it with the x-ray scan. And, you know, just to underscore that point, I think that adding that third element of getting a good history and exam of a patient and having a relationship with them where you understand what their pain is and what generates it. And, um, you know, what are like the specific movements, for example, that trigger every time. And I think bringing all three of those pieces together really help clinch the diagnosis. So joint arthritis is uh, one of those tricky objects because patients, the pain they feel can be diffuse typically, um, and it can mimic pain from other areas like the discs in the spine, having degeneration or dehydration in the discs uh, in between the vertebrae. It can mimic muscular pain um, and also spine nerve irritation. So, you know, that's another one where you really have to talk to your patients and bring the papers together with the real person sitting in front of you. Um, and specifically, if you look at the pictures Dr. Salama has, the very, and I think does a good example of just showing facet joints, which are the two um, knobby looking structures in the bottom part of the screen. Um, so the facet joints are a connection of the vertebrae. So one vertebrae sitting on top of each other is always connected by the disc. That's what we think about, but that's in the front. In the back part, there's an interlocking joint on both sides, the left and right side. Um, and, and, that, and you can look at that picture. It shows you the top part, which is uh, from one of the vertebrae and the bottom, and there's a black line. And then below that, there's the bottom part, uh, which is from the vertebrae adjacent to it. And so that joint is actually quite dynamic. And there's a lot of movement there that allows us to flex or bend forward or extend our spine. Um, and it's a joint just like any other joint you have in your body, like your knee or your knuckles. Or, um, and so it can get arthritis and it will create a pain um, that's a, a very dull, achy type of pain for most people. Although it can be sharp, the joint can also get cysts, which is a like fluid sac that will compress on the adjacent structures around the joint. So, um, the, the tricky part about arthritis in the 
lumbar spine, for example, is that not only do you get the pain from the actual joint, but you get pain from what the joint is doing by becoming arthritic. It starts overgrowing, develops spurs, and it will start pressing on the nerves within the spine. And so it can cause a double effect of causing its own pain and then a pain that's related to things that it's doing in the surrounding structures. So what we're typically looking for in joint arthritis is if that joint is overgrown, is there a high fluid signal in the joint? Um, and then, you know, many times joint arthritis is a very clinical diagnosis or the pain from joint arthritis is a clinical diagnosis. So although we may not see um, a lot of arthritic changes, it doesn't have to be dramatic. We compare that with the clinical exam and what patients feel uh, on a daily basis and what triggers their pain. And that's how we guide our treatment. Yeah, something else that MRI is very good at, and you sort of mentioned it, is picking up fluid where it shouldn't be, or edema and inflammation. And that we really can't, that information we really can't get from a x-ray and we it's very hard to pick up on a CT. So MRI is really good for showing us areas of inflammation of the soft tissues and it shows us that there's extra water where there shouldn't be or swelling. Um, so, so that's a really good use of MR. Shall yeah. we move on to CT? Yeah, let's do it. I think as we talk about this arthritis that Dr. Joshi was explaining, um, so CAT scan is another tool that we can use to look at the bony structures um, in really high resolution detail. And we can slice through the body in many ways to look at all the bony structures. And it also gives us a good appreciation of what's going on in the soft tissues, not to the extent that MRI does, but certainly um, more information than an X-ray would give. Um, so these images are showing basically what Dr. Joshi was um, talking about, where we have these joints in the back of the spine, where the arrows are on the left side. We have the yellow arrow, the orange arrow, and the red arrow. And it's showing you the connection between two vertebrae or the backbones in the lumbar spine. So the yellow arrow is showing you mild changes. The bones are relative. If you look at the white outline, they're relatively smooth. They're not jagged. They're touching each other nicely. There's a smooth space between them. And then as you move over, the orange arrow is beginning to show that things don't look so smooth anymore. That white outline is getting thick. The connection between the two bones is getting a little bit irregular or, or not clean and equal along the entire space. And then the next image over to the right with the red arrow is showing you what severe arthritis looks like or severe degeneration. And it's showing you that that normal white line that outlines our bones is basically gone. And I mean, you still have the edge of the bone there, but it's really irregular. It's really overgrown. There's a lot of spurring. Um, and this is an example of what severe arthritis of your facet joint or the, those joints that connect the two backbones look like on CAT scan or, or CT examination. And this is really helpful information because if you have pain that's coming from these facet joints, interventionalists or people that do needle guided procedures can treat this, um, you know, treat this pain syndrome and, and relieve some pain. Um, the image on the right shows a different process. Um, this is where the alignment of the bones are, are not as expected. So you have one, um, an example where one vertebral body or one bone in the spine is moved forward compared to the other. So the alignment is not correct. And this can be from a variety of reasons. And it's really important to understand why, because if you need surgical correction of this, it's treated in a particular way and it's treated potentially differently than if you, depending on the cause of this abnormality. So in this patient, the patient's bones that connect the front part of their vertebral body and the back part of their vertebral body are separated. Um, it can happen for a lot of reasons, but this is what this patient has. And a CT is the best way to diagnose this with certainty. Um, An X-ray has suggestive features. Sometimes you can see it on X-ray. Sometimes you can see it on MR. But this is certainly one of these scenarios where this piece of information is extremely important to pass along to a surgeon for them to know prior to going to the operating room with a patient. 
below the actual CT images, I just included a picture of a CAT scan machine, mostly so you can see the difference, what it looks like compared to the MRI machine and that it is a donut and you are still going through sort of a tube. It's just a shorter tube than the MR machine. Um, and that's just to get you comfortable with um, knowing what it might be like for you to experience going into a CAT scan room. Um, this, while we're talking about CT, I did, I did see um, a patient's question in terms of how to evaluate hardware. And I thought that was a really good question because there are so many choices. Um, so hardware is interesting. Um, obviously, post-surgical patients are often complex um, and occasionally they do need their hardware evaluated. And we use a combination of imaging to do this. Um, usually an x-ray is the first step. It allows us to see the hardware. Is it intact? Are there any changes that we can see on x-ray that suggest that it might be loosened or moved? Um, and then getting an even higher resolution image of that, if there is any concern, your next step would be a CT. Um, and that's because we're able to see the bony structures in relationship to the metal that's placed by the surgeon. So x-ray probably first, usually followed by CT. Sometimes patients will skip the x-ray depending on what the surgeon wants. And occasionally MRI can be used in conjunction with all of that in a post-operative patient because it can tell us other causes of pain generator besides the hardware itself that might be giving a patient a problem that's not necessarily related to the hardware that was placed itself. So um, it, it's probably all three imaging types can be used in post-operative patients for various reasons. And that's a conversation that really has to be individualized to the patient, the surgeon, and, and what the symptoms are. Dr. Salama, going off that, can you go off, can you go a little more into the idea some patients may have heard the word pseudarthrosis and how that relates to CT and and uh, what or what else you would like to see to kind of evaluate that? Sure. Um, so Pseudoarthrosis can happen when you're, you have surgery and the goal of surgery is to get fusion of the bones in the spine to limit mobility um, and to keep things in place. And sometimes that happens where it fuses and sometimes it doesn't fuse. And if the intention was to fuse and it doesn't fuse and there's motion um, at the joint space where things are supposed to be connected, that can be a pain generator for patients. And often this is in the, this can happen in the post-surgical setting. Um, and it's important information for the surgeon and the patient to find out. And CT is going to really be the, the main um, modality or type of imaging that one would use to look for this. We can, there's certain findings that we see in the bones that suggest that it's not actually fused and there's still space left and there might be motion between two bones of the spine. Um, that we weren't expecting. That being said, we also can use MR for this as well. Um, and like going back to the conversation we were having before, you can see edema sometimes at the level where there should be fusion and there wasn't. And that edema can suggest that that's causing pain for the patient. So generally we start with CT if we're looking for pseudoarthrosis, but MR can also be very useful for evaluating that. Excellent. And then staying on the topic of CT, uh, Dr. Joshi, some patients may be asked to get an injection for something called a myelogram. Uh, can you help explain why someone would ask for that or order that and uh, kind of what that process is for patients? Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, MRI, a patient can't get an MRI um, because they have some medical condition that may preclude uh, the, their ability to get it, um, or they um, have hardware. So MRI is difficult uh, in patients who have hardware, as Dr. Salam was saying, it uh, distorts the internal, uh, our view of the internal structures around that metallic implant. And so many times we'll order what's called a CT myelogram, where uh, someone like Dr. Salama will actually inject um, a special type of contrast agent in the spinal fluid. Um, that's an instance where we actually purposefully go into the spinal fluid area. Um, we talked earlier about uh, getting a dural puncture headache. When, um, so this is where we're actually purposefully going there, injecting contrast dye, and a CT scan is obtained to help us 
look at structures as we would in a, in a patient who could get an MRI, for example. Um, maybe Dr. Salama, you, you guys do these all the time because, you know, um, in the radiology suite, I could, uh, you know, it's very similar to getting an epidural, for example, you know, you're laying down and uh, your skin is cleansed to prevent infection and local anesthetic, which is numbing medicine is placed in the skin. And then a very small needle is used to enter the spinal fluid area. And, the, and then uh, the medication or dye is injected and then the images are taken. So it's a very pretty simple, straightforward process. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but you know, it's a very good way for us to uh, look at uh, or mimic what we may see on an MRI in a patient who otherwise couldn't. Yeah, exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head where in patients that you can't get the MR, but you're still worried about disc pathology where they may have a disc herniation or there may be some other pathology that's affecting that spinal canal where there's no bone there, so you can't really see it on the CT, you can't really see it on the x-ray, and you need a better look of what's going on inside the canal where the nerve roots are. When we put the contrast in, we're basically saying, okay, we can see where all the normal fluid lives and what's pushing on the fluid in different spots that might be causing the patient's pain. Um, and, and that allows us to diagnose things that we wouldn't be able to see on a regular CAT scan if a patient couldn't get an MRI. We also use it often in patients who have a lot of hardware. Um, so anytime somebody has hardware, it creates an artifact. It, it morphs the image that we see on the MRI scan. And sometimes it actually blocks our view of things that we really need to look at. So if that's the case, if we need to look at certain areas that are getting blocked by this artifact when patients have their hardware, we can do a myelogram. And the artifact is there, but much less and we actually get a better visualization um, on what's actually going on in the region of the hardware. So it's often used also in post-operative patients that have hardware, even if they can get an MR, they may get an MR and then somebody might request a CT myelogram on top of it to get a better view of some of the regions that we couldn't see on the MRI. And Dr. Salam, are there any um, general risks or things that you counsel patients on before uh, starting a CT myelogram? So as Dr. Joshi said, with any spinal injection, you know, there's the risk of bleeding, there's the risk of infection, um, injury to the surrounding structures, which essentially we do it below the level of the spinal cord. So it's just nerve roots and that's the safest place to go. Um, anytime we put a needle through the sac that holds the CSF, there's always a risk of post lumbar or headache or CSF leak. Although we use at Cornell, we use very special types of needles and size of needles to reduce that risk here. We're very conscious of um, And then some patients do experience pain during the procedure, particularly patients that already have a lot of compression on their nerves that are causing them pain, and that's why they're there for the procedure. Sometimes we can exacerbate that pain. It's often um, it, it's a temporary feeling, and it's usually not severe, but patients do report that sometimes their pain increases during the procedure, and then slowly, you know, within 30 minutes to an hour, goes down after the procedure. Excellent. Well, we covered a lot of topics today, uh, from x-ray to CT, MRI, as well as injection. Um, we just have a few questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, so uh, we can just go back to a few uh, topics from before. Um, one question was, um, again, the role of nerve ablation. Dr. Joshi, maybe you can help us with this. Uh, if someone has a disc herniation, what type of injection would you recommend generally at one level? Sure. For a disc herniation, um, I think that the most common type of injection that a patient would get is an epidural steroid injection. The reason for that is that, you know, a lot of people come in and they, they have heard about nerve ablation um, and they were really interested in doing that because it has the opportunity to give long-term relief. Um, the issue with nerve ablation is that what we're actually, it depends on the nerve that we're trying to ablate. And so the actual nerve that we're ablating um, in 
when we're doing it in the lumbar spine or the cervical spine, for example, is a very small branch, uh, so small you can't even see it on an MRI, a branch of a, a spinal nerve, which is like a big nerve that we've been talking about that comes out of the spine and goes down the leg. And so it's a, a just an offshoot of that. And it does not have specifically motor function. It doesn't control movement of your legs. It doesn't control feeling in your skin. So we can actually do something to manipulate or destroy that nerve. Um, however, when you have an issue with a spinal nerve, which is the nerve that's typically affected by a disc herniation, the disc is pressing out, is squishing the nerves. You're creating you, the spine canal. It is what it is. It's a, the, the space that you have is the space that you have. So if something comes in it, like a disc, um, or anything or fluid or anything else, then all the things that are there have less space to exist. And so with a disc herniation, the disc is actually pressing on a spinal nerve. And that nerve has a lot of function. It's a very complicated nerve. It controls movement in your leg. It controls feeling in your leg. So it's not a nerve that we want to destroy. So we don't ablate it. So the most common, quickest way to help patients treat their pain from a disc herniation if you were going to get an injection is to do an epidural steroid injection that being said not everyone needs to have a, an injection done to treat their pain so we we're very selective about the patients who we feel will benefit from that and where we feel like it's appropriate and safe form of therapy um there's a multitude of treatments so uh, you know the cornerstone is physical therapy getting back strong, preventing further injury. And also teaching people about posture, biomechanics. That doesn't mean what you do, but it's just modifying how you do it. Uh, there are certain medications that we use. We even have started incorporating things like mindfulness, cognitive therapy. So focusing on your own coping mechanisms to manage pain. And we work very closely with the Integrative Health Center at Cornell to focus on alternative healing therapies like acupuncture, nutrition, uh, mind-body therapy, um, uh, and also um, just like herbal supplements if people are interested in that. So there's multitude of treatments. Not everyone needs an injection. Not everyone should have an injection. Thank you. Well said. That was very helpful, Dr. Joshi. Um, so we're pretty much done here. Dr. Salam, any parting words or last thoughts on our uh, talk from discussion from today? Oop, I think you're muted. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, no, I, I just I think this um, you know webinar is a perfect example of how at Cornell we really work together for the patient. Um, we get input from all different sorts of physicians and providers to make sure that the appropriate imaging is being done. Not only is it being done, but it's being done correctly while the patient is in their scanner or in their X-ray room, and then afterwards that is interpreted correctly in the sense that we use the information in conjunction with their history, in conjunction with their physical exam, and make sure that patients really getting a comprehensive evaluation and an appropriate treatment plan. Um, and and that, that, that's the most important part of imaging is that it's done in conjunction with all of the providers and in conjunction with the patient. Excellent. And I think with that, we'll wrap up. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Salama and Dr. Joshi. Uh, this is, like uh, Dr. Salama said, really the benefit of uh, being here at Cornell and at the uh, uh, Comprehensive uh, Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. And so uh, with that, I especially want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope that was helpful. And of course, we're always here. If any other questions or uh, concerns come up, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.